Well, good afternoon, friends and members of St. Martin Lutheran Church. This is Pastor Jim. Today is Wednesday, the 4th, May the 4th. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at Psalm 23. And as you can hear in the background, that. Uh, they're doing construction right outside of my window. And for some reason, uh, whoever it is decides that they're going to honk the horn every five seconds. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure what it is, uh, so bear with me. It's the, the horn honking is distracting, but I'm going to try not to let it distract me too much uh, from our scripture for today, which is Psalm 23, uh, perhaps some of the most uh, beloved scripture we have, and for a reason, I think, for a reason we're going to find, because Psalm 23 shows us truly uh, the heart of God, uh, what the heart of God is, that a God of love and a God of grace and a God of mercy. So if you have your Bibles open or perhaps you're reading on your phone as well, we are reading Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. <laughs> Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, one author put it this way, that Psalm 23 is a way for you and I to warm ourselves against the cold reality of this world. And it's here in Psalm 23 that we see the heart of God most clearly, that we acknowledge that the story of God and David is the story of Christ in us, that, that we are his sheep. And behind Psalm 23, the psalm of Yahweh, of, of God, is that God is the faithful shepherd. The faithful shepherd who led his people out of the land of death, miraculously sustained them in the desert, and brought them to the promised land flowing with milk and honey. And the faithful shepherd chose David, a shepherd boy, to become the shepherd of his people and to bear his promise, namely, that one from his line would reign forever, would come the Messiah. And then when the flock was scattered, as we read in Ezekiel, the promise from God, from the, promise, from the prophet Ezekiel is this, is indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek out my sheep and deliver them. That God says, I myself will come down there and, and find my sheep scattered and I will seek them out and I will deliver them. And uh, our gospel for Sunday is John chapter 10, where Jesus talking about being the good shepherd as well. And that'll, that'll be the preaching text for this Sunday, so I don't want to get too off on it. But this idea of God as a shepherd, we find it throughout the Old Testament. Uh, as early as Genesis 39, where Jacob himself refers to the Lord as shepherd. We see God as our shepherd not only in Psalm 23, but Psalm 28 and Psalm 80. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, that the words of the wise are given by one shepherd, referring to God. In Isaiah 40, God promises through the prophet Isaiah that he will feed his flock like a shepherd. And again, through the prophet Micah, that uh, our Lord invites the Lord shepherd, invites God as the Lord and shepherd to shepherd his people as he did of old. And Zechariah speaking of the Messiah as the shepherd who will be struck and his sheep scattered. And our gospel for this week from John chapter 10, where Jesus refers to himself as, I am the good shepherd. And as well as and many other references in the New Testament, uh, 1 Peter 2 and Hebrews 13, uh, Christ as our good shepherd. And in, in, in my studies, interestingly, one of the very first uh, renderings of Jesus, meaning paintings that, that have ever been found, is uh, at the, the St. Callisto catacombs in Rome, and it's dated sometime b before 300 AD, but it's a familiar picture uh, of Jesus holding a lamb on, on his shoulders. 
uh, one of the earliest renderings anyway, uh, or paintings that w we have of Jesus. And so our psalm begins on, on a very personal note. Notice that David says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. It's, it, for David, this is a personal thing. This is not a, a shepherd removed, but is my shepherd. And then he says, I shall not want. I shall not want. That God's shepherd-like care is at the same time the end of our dissatisfied need. And this, this I shall not want, it, it's both a declaration and, and a confession as well. And by the way, it's also a, a declaration and a confession that I shall not want that only the poor in spirit can relate to. If someone's not poor in spirit, meaning understanding who you and I are, that without God we're nothing, we can take no comfort in his words. And in verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The implication, of course, is that the sheep doesn't always know what it needs. It, is that not true? Uh, that you and I, we don't always know what we need. He makes us lie down in green pasture. Uh, he leads me beside still waters. That the lamb doesn't need to know where the green pastures are. The lamb doesn't need to know where the still waters are. All we need to do is follow the shepherd, and he leads us there. And in verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So the leadership of the shepherd, the leadership of God that we submit ourselves to for comfort, for restoration, but for also for leading in righteousness in his name, not in ours. It has a moral aspect to it, if you will, a, a holy obedience to God's law and to God's word. And then it's in verse 4 that we get this kind of first dark note in the psalm. And it's in verse 4, frankly, that, that many people uh, get stuck on. They can't get past. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That with the shepherds leading, we walk through the valley. The valley's not a destination. It's not our dwelling place. That death is only a temporary and momentary danger in our path. That, and during that time, we fear no evil. Not that evil doesn't exist, not that evil doesn't befall us, but we don't fear it. We go, as one of the early church fathers wrote, the saints whistle happily through the valley of death. Why? Because we know that we have nothing to fear from evil. We have nothing to fear from death. Why? And here's where the shift from third to second person comes, for you are with me. David goes from talking about God to speaking directly to him. It's in the presence of the shepherd that eliminated this fear for you are with me, for you are with me. And, and here's the exact quote. Near death, the saint still calmly walks. He does not need to quicken his pace in alarm or panic. Near death, the saint does not walk in the valley, but through it. And is that not such a struggle for many people today? I know many people I come into contact with, uh, if, if their particular walk, if, if they're not walking with the Lord, if they're not submitting to his word and to his will, then death and that dark valley do seem like the end, do seem like that's all there is, that death does get the last word. But here we're promised in this great shepherd psalm that we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We ain't staying there. And we continue in verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And this, this preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies, it has this kind of dual meaning to it, I think. And on one side, it's in the midst of my enemies, God provides. But also, also, and this is not something until within the last few years I read this verse, God prepares this table in the midst of our enemies, not, not just to provide for us, but to provide a means of reconciliation 
through this table where we can sit down with our enemies at the Lord's table and, and have reconciliation, that it's possible that God at least provides the means. It's not always going to work, but it's certainly possible. And what does God give us? He anoints our head with oil just as, as prophets did with kings in the Old Testament, anointed them that we're, our heads are anointed with oil and our cup overflows, meaning the grace and the mercy that God gives us in our cup, it just overflows. We could never contain it all. His hesed, steadfast love. And then the great promise, the great promise in verse 6, that surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That this... Uh, this promise is, is for today and for tomorrow. This, this calm assurance that we will enjoy the presence of the Lord forever, both in his days and our days on this earth and, and beyond. You know, part of our communion liturgy, we talk about how that's a, a foretaste of the feast to come when one day we get this taste of the feast that Christ will once again reside and preside over as he does in Psalm 23 as the host providing us with uh, everlasting life. And in the New Testament, Jesus is going to declare in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and I lay my life down for the sheep. We see in Psalm 23 that Jesus, the good shepherd, fulfills all the promises made in Psalm 23, every single one of them. That Jesus is the one who guides us safely through death's dark valley. That Jesus is the one who serves us his supper, offering the gift of forgiveness today and the promise of eternal forgiveness in eternity. And that this supper is a foretaste of the feast that he will serve at the end of time. Jesus anoints us with his spirit. He fills our cup to overflowing with his grace and his mercy. And he gives us a permanent dwelling place with him. Psalm 23. It, it's, it's, someone, it's the favorite psalm for many people. It's the psalm we read at almost every funeral, at least I've been a part of or been to. Why? Because I think, I think it, it reveals uh, so beautifully the heart of God a heart we all need to see, and a heart, frankly, I think we need to convey to the world, which when, when you see death as the end, when, when in your mind death is the end, then life becomes quite different. We start striving for different things. So I think that's all I got to say. It, it's hard to speak on Psalm 23. It's, it's so meaningful and so sublime uh, and, and so, so pure that uh, we could almost just read it and nod at each other and, and, uh, and pray. But, uh, but I, I pray all is going well with you. I didn't see me yesterday. I was out uh, uh, fishing for, for fish. <laughs> Today, I guess we're fishing for men, but I was fishing for, for fish yesterday, and I, I did quite, I did fairly well. Caught a few walleye uh, and had some good fun. But uh, thank you so much for joining uh, me today. I uh, invite you to, to join us for worship this evening or on Sunday as well uh, when we take a very uh, closer look at John chapter 10 in Jesus' Good Shepherd dialogue with his disciples. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Receive the Lord's blessing. Be a blessing to others. I love you guys, and I hope to see you soon. God bless.